So perhaps with this sixth episode, uh, one more tutorial about mastering styles or just ways of playing on the piano to create different moods, uh, you know, characters, uh, all kinds of ways to communicate ideas on the keyboard. Okay, so let's say we go back to the twinkle twinkle example where I've already mentioned it before, you can take literally these four chords, there's a tonic, right, there's a subdominant, and then there's the dominant chord. So with these three different chords, you pretty much take care of 90% of the music that you play, or well, traditional sound in music anyway. So, uh, super uh, subdominant S, tonic, So okay, and then the last bit subdominant, tonic, dominant, tonic. All right, so let's get rid of this thing one more time and start putting ideas down. So we have subdominant tonic dominant tonic idea and now these block chords they don't really communicate much about the style they just sound like okay there is the harmony now what right it's kind of static it's not moving anywhere so i think one of the first things that i learned as part of my music theory training if you like or some people like to call it keyboard skills and all kinds of other words depending on what um, culture you grow up in but um, from these block chords where you're just sounding out the three notes or however many notes together you can create patterns so one of the famous patterns is called hmm it's called arpeggiation pattern. So you start on the low note and you go up through the three notes of your harmony up and then you just cycle and repeat. All right, and you use those chords. Let's choose another key. I'm kind of getting tired of G major. Uh, G major, C major. Now let's go to G major. So you would, in if you do this soprano tenor, soprano tenor, I keep seeing S and T, and of course the other abbreviation for S and T is soprano and tenor. Subdominant, tonic, dominant, tonic. Now, by the way, when I teach to play uh, these kinds of patterns and the fifth finger has to go to the black key, even if you are a beginner, I teach uh, to put the key, the hand pretty close, pretty far inside the keys like that, because I just find it easier to go. Right, that, that fifth finger is right next to the F sharp. Anyway, um, so here it is, and you add that simple melody of the twinkle twinkle. Um, Of course, because it's a one, two, three, one, two, three kind of feel, uh, the rhythm is not quite the same. Almost sounds like a waltz, uh, which we'll get to now. So, besides playing these notes as an arpeggio, one, two, three, one, two, three, we can combine and do this. Now I'm writing these note heads down, but of course it's it's just a, an, an example. So in this particular case, I'm just alternating between maybe do a little uh, eighth note rhythm there, uh, a little bit of uh, polka accompaniment. Or let's do G major. Let's actually do D major. Let's do D minor. In 
the traditional way to play the subdominant harmony if you're in a minor key is to move the thumb only up a half step. Right, and that suddenly becomes your new style, new feel, um, let's see, new genre. Again, the words don't matter so much. Right, those last four notes of the twinkle twinkle. Um, what's what else and there's the waltz again so you're using these same same block chords for your positions three different positions but you're trying to coordinate your fingers in all these different ways and I clearly remember working on that sometime during my beginner piano career. And again, our twinkle twinkle uh, melody becomes a little bit sh long, short, long, short, long, short, long, or slow, fast, slow, fast, slow. Again, it, I find these terms long, short, fast, slow, a bit confusing when you're trying to explain how to feel the rhythm. Kind of like the Kodai method where you go ta ti ta ti ta ti ta where you actually use syllables to contrast different pulses in music. Okay, so we have three patterns so far which each creates its own feel when you play, when you apply it to some harmony, some melody, uh, anything else I'm thinking about? Well, perhaps at, at some point uh, Alberti bass would be a good idea to get familiar with. Alright, so this is the bottom note, top, middle, top, bottom, classical period. Right. It's, a, it's a great way to create propulsion in music while creating a reasonably light accompaniment. And so, yeah, same thing. Or in a different key. Also remember that idea that we can improvise a little bit on the dominant. Something. Anyway, so uh, these complemental patterns, once you master them, you're already oops, um, opening up this world of possibilities of generating a different feeling in music on the spot, right? So you're not reading anything specific, you know the, the simple song, you know the simple chord positions, and you're instantly trying to apply that knowledge to just play around with these ideas. And before you know it, you're just... You know, you're just continuing to play around with your own Alberti bass, uh, making your own sonatina or some other such classical piece. So yeah, I thought maybe this episode highlights and again ways to uh, practice not even specifically improvisation per se, but more of that extemporization concept that I mentioned last episode because I think if you throw yourself into improvisation and you think, okay, where are my bearings? And you have none, it can be actually quite constraining. You're just like, kind of lost because probably unless you're a kid who enjoys to make sounds and, and you feel absolutely fine, uh, you kind of want some guidance, right? So that the result of your attempt at improvising or extemporizing 
sounds satisfying in some way right away. So once you take um, concrete ideas, apply them to concrete harmonies, melodies, and just use that as your guidance, I certainly think that it can be in a way liberating way because once you understand those bearings now you feel a little bit more steady and ready to make your own journey forward anyway at least it was the case for me when i was starting out and look at where it got me mm -hmm.